So first of all, it's a huge pleasure to meet you in our neck of the woods, and uh, I, I guess you are doing a Baltic tour uh, currently, more or less. Yeah, a small tour. I mean, this is my first time in Latvia, and it was my first time in Lithuania, so I'm excited to you know, be in this part of Europe. I've, we had an amazing time in Lithuania, we were treated really well, and the festival was great, and I'm really excited about the show tomorrow. Mm. Uh, what was uh, your uh, what, what has been your exposure to this part of Europe uh, so far, and your knowledge of the territory in general? Well, I mean, obviously, the problem with, with education is you get bombarded with like the louder things. So mm. you know, like obviously, like German, Austrian, like culture, especially music, sure, um, Hungarian and stuff. So I actually have very little knowledge of like the deep art scene in this part of Europe, so I'm really excited to hear, for example, um, at the show the other night, we were exposed to um, classical composers from Lithuania, and just things that I never would have heard of. But of course, I'm aware of stylistically what the, the kind of things that were being used mm. in like early 20th century uh, composition with like chamber music, but yeah, I, I'm happy to sort of be shown things because I do know a lot about sort of European um, music because I studied quite a lot, but there's just obviously so much, mm. and obviously things change because of um, you know different kind of cultures like um, sort of overpowering others and you know these kind of things throughout history. Um, well, it's easy to just get uh, overwhelmed with the sheer amount of information nowadays, and yeah, with, with the luxury of. Uh, Allowing yourself to be quite chaotic and sporadic in your musical and uh, what general interests you at least can try to navigate and limit yourself in this regard. But uh, so, uh, from what I gather, you started out uh, in music uh, as a guitar player. Yeah. Uh, did you teach guitar yourself uh, or did you study with a tutor? Uh, so, yeah, I had a teacher for a while. A very short while, and then I became so enthusiastic that I just started to teach myself, uh, which I think is quite common. And of course, you do, you, you kind of incorp incorporate mistakes and like strange understandings within that because I was so young. But over time, you then understand better and you build a better understanding. But I was just very obsessive about um, writing music and playing music as soon as I started to learn around 12 years old. Okay. Uh, what was the spark uh, which ignited your interest to, towards uh, being more than just a consumer of music? Uh, I'm not sure really because I, I, well, I've always been really obsessed with making in, in any kind of medium. Um, so I think it just happened that once I got into this, and it could have been anything maybe, it could have been like photography or film, I just felt like I was the kind of young mind that once given a deep world like music or like the other examples, it just was, it became obsessed by it because you can do so much mm -hmm. and you can, there's so much kind of structure to it. I'm quite interested in structure and obviously music, you can really explore stru structure because right. it's time-based and it's just very interesting to me, still to this day. So I think there was no like pre-attitude, it was just apart from the fact that I'm, obs I'm quite a little bit of an obsessive maker sort of personality. Mm. Um, so yeah, I just think it was just you know it was an example of something that my my mind got um, sucked into. Mm. Um, but still, after this initial um, path of a guitar player, you try you, you understood you have to shift gears or maybe uh, focus, refocus yourself, and uh, you start you study music technology afterwards in yeah. Western. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, how did you make this conscious decision, and at what age uh, did that happen? Um, so, I was around the... Actually, the thing is, I was a little bit kind of confused after school because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Is that the case with all of us? Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, some people just go immediately onto the next level of education. I took a few years out, and I, and I, and I, I volunteered at a radio station and created kind of jingles. and. Oh. Things to, I did lots of different random things for a while, and then eventually I went to university um, around the you know early twenties. I think I graduated when I was twenty three, two thousand and six to two thousand and nine. Um, but 
I just was slowly drawn into electronic music um, because I it's that classic thing where when you work with uh, musicians and you try to make music in a band, that is one way of making music. But obviously when you work with a computer in a very kind of selfish, almost egotistical way, you mm. can sketch ideas out and then immediately hear them back. And when I was younger, that was so exciting for me because obviously the same things are happening with musicians, but there's much more than that going on. Yeah. And so I think I got really sort of seduced by how quick everything was. The fact, the fact that you could just dream of something and then you could hear it back. Uh, no matter, I'm not talking about whether it's good or bad, but just the fact that that could happen. Yeah, yeah. So I think that kind of pulled me into the electronic music world, um, just like the immediacy of it and, and the fact that you could compose in sort of very different ways. Because up until this point, my awareness of music was very narrow because I didn't grow up around people that had a big understanding of music and were showing me things. It was very... Your folks were uh, not musicians? No, there's no kind of real artistic um, interest in my family. And it was a very kind of like working class town, neighborhood. So it was really just popular music for a long time. Um, and this, the, the university course that I went on was actually amazing because the opposite, it was very avant-garde. Mm -hmm. It was basically the last... Well, basically, the, the sort of more abstract thinkers of all time in music, very little practical like skills were taught. It was more just like thinking, learn, like thinking mm -hmm. about thinking. Um, so that was really good for me. Um, but it was one of those degrees where half of the people hated it and half of the people loved it because it divided people on this idea of practicality and, um, you know, it, it was borderline philosophical, really. I mean, the applicability of the knowledge uh, for the real world, the world, so to speak. Yeah. That, that presented some people with problems. Yeah, it creates a lot of sort of frustration in people because some people, I think, want a clearer um, set of steps to the, what they want. But I was just happy to be uh, exposed to such un un radical things. Um, so it was great. And, if, and because I... Because I already had this kind of obsession with music, like popular music in general, it felt really good because it was like the two worlds were coming together. Yeah. Not immediately, but over time you could sort of piece together these two worlds and how they are in conflict but also complement each other and also obviously they overlap sort of, and yeah, they overlap. And merge. Yeah, but there's, so, there's such interesting things going on in these two giant worlds. Mm. Well, uh We'll talk about your studies more a bit uh, later in the conversation, but I'm quite keen on getting to know uh, what was your exposure to electronic music uh, in your maybe early teens and, 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 right. and after that. So it would have been quite obvious things like popular music such as The Prodigy. Um, music of the Jilted Generation. Yeah, the land that yeah exactly. Things like that. They're, they're best stuff in my humble opinion. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, of course, like lots of well-known acts like Chemical Brothers, Daft Punk. So lots of popular music, basically, like big names that did electronic music. Um, some like sort of techno-y things like Jeff Mills, um, because there were tapes going around of like sort of uh, mixtapes of sort of like techno DJ sets and things like that. But it was mainly popular music. Um, I'm trying to think... If I would mention two more names, yes, yeah, try, try. such as Square Pusher yeah. and Graphic Twin, well, would I offend you? No, or no, 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 no that, came, that came in as well, but I'm just, yeah, this, what I'm saying is that the, the names that I mentioned first came first, like oh. when I was like 12, 13, and then I found out I was exposed to FX Twin probably around like the late 90s, around the time of Window Liquor, I think. Um, and then that, yeah, that made a profound influence on me. And then obviously all of the warp artists, such as Orteca and Square Pusher and Clark. But yeah, um, it's difficult for me to understand the timeline, but for a long time it was just popular music and then you yeah, crept in more sort of experimental artists. Um, I became kind of obsessed actually with Apex Twin, as many people did at that time, I think. Um, but I was still very much... Only just getting started in trying to produce and make music um, with sort of non traditional instruments. Uh, but yeah, definitely like, yeah, Apex Twin and 
um, yeah, you know, Venetian snares and like many, yeah, sort of. Boards of Canada. Yeah, Boards of Canada. Um, yeah, just many, many artists of that sort of like late 90s, early 2000s, kind of. Because there was so much creativity then, it felt like. Um, it was very, it felt very exciting and things were happening all the time um, in quite a fresh way. So that was very exciting. And that definitely inspired the record that you mentioned earlier, my first album, I.O. Um, so, yeah, was, you know. And then from then, obviously, there's loads, lots of things. I was exposed to lots of things through university and that changed everything. Uh, when I... Uh... I am speaking about my exposure to electronic music, not that it matters much in uh, the context of this conversation. We have to keep in mind that uh, Eastern Europe also uh, came a bit late to the party, because of, right. apart from uh, certain uh, very keen enthusiasts, mm -hmm. uh, the music from the Western Europe reached us with a little delay, let's yeah. say some years, especially uh, before uh, the uh, internet generation, uh, which... Uh, uh, Brought such products as uh, Napster or uh, yeah. uh, those more or less uh, streaming services. Before we were like uh, stealing music as crazy uh, through the file sharing pro programs, etc. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you enrolled in uh, your university, as you mentioned, two thousand two to two thousand three, no, six to nine, six to nine. Oh, no, sorry, two thousand six to two thousand nine. But I was also studying other electronic courses earlier than that, mm -hmm. um, like sound engineering. Yeah, but not degree level, but yeah. Well, but you got quite a deep understanding of uh, the processes. Uh, yeah, quite well, sort. kind of. Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm the kind of person that understands a lot through doing. I like to do, do the thing to really understand it. <clears throat> so it's both. If you mention um, the element of control. Uh, maybe in other spheres, uh, being an electronic musician, I mean, that's uh, the ultimate level of control. There's yeah. an immediacy that yeah. you, you, you create something and then you can test it right away, how it sounds. Yeah. And also, uh, for the most part, uh, well, apart from divine intervention, mm -hmm. you are the boss. In the yeah, situation. yeah, it's quite a kind of um, like a director's role. Um, and and also the main star of the show. Yeah, which is obviously good and bad because it's good because you, uh, from an outsider perspective, you can really get a very hyper personal um, piece of art that's made that's just like a singular vision. <clears throat> so, obviously, to some extent, you are using equipment, so you could argue that it's different people, but you know, it's quite a singular, like a writer, you know, when you read a book, a novel, you are really getting a singular vision of the writer. Um, Electronic music, I feel similar to that, and also you, you tend to work in isolation, just like a, a writer classically would. Um, but yeah, the, obviously the, the downside of that is that it can become too insular, and it can lack outside inspiration. It can become a little bit too confined, self-contained as well. Yeah. So, it, it, and obviously, some people can do it for small amounts of time, and then they need other things. And some people, I, I feel like I I could write music forever I, on my own, which sounds kind of crazy, but I just, it, I like the environment of making with technology, um, and it just feels like you can just, almost like research and development, you can not try to make music, but you can just explore, mm -hmm. um, and then, of, of course, things come to, come to you that, you know, should present themselves as like ideas with potential, and then you can start to construct music, like, you know, st structures. But I, I, I make all the time, almost like research and development, without the pressure to make songs or pieces of music. And because of that, I feel like it's, it never exhausts itself because it's, it's quite, um, there's no pressure, it's just like this open world of like exploration. Mm -hmm. Interesting that you mentioned that there is no pressure because uh, it, the current zeitgeist is all about competitiveness, about mm. uh, agility, about uh, being able to do this, 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 this and that. And uh, in the same time, uh, when one listens to your music, uh, there is this sense of deep immersion in, into, uh, if, if in, for example, in the context of one album, uh, that you are going on a journey, that you are exploring, or you are maybe viewing some uh, mega architectural structure from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. From the outside, from within, etc. If, if it makes any sense. To you. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, I just I think it's just because I'm quite obsessive, 
I tend to explore a lot of things and then distill it. I try to make everything very focused and considered that's, mm-hmm. that's released. Even if it's, you know, three notes, I might have spent a year asking myself if those three notes are justified, you know, and mm-hmm. all these kind of things. Because that's uh, another danger of uh, uh, creators of electronic music. Uh, with this immediacy comes the maybe uh, desire uh, to overproduce, uh, to, 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 to do this, 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 this. Yeah. Yeah, it's very difficult. I think it's really difficult to make music with, in the electronic sort of domain. There's, there are many uh, like dangers such as that. And um, also one thing that I think is quite amazing but also problematic about mm-hmm. it is that you tend to become a designer and you tend to design sounds in the same way that someone might design a typeface, like in typography. But because you're not only you composing but designing, it's so many different tasks. It doesn't have to be, but people tend to do this. Mm. It's very easy to um, to spend a long time constructing something that might not be relevant for the particular composition that you're working on. So I think you always have to have this very overall attitude where you might design a, an ingredient, like a, a synth sound, yes, like and the functionality of that, but it might be useful in two years' time. And you need to know, well, this is just my opinion, but I think, I think you need to know that just let make be happy that you've made something that you think good, useful, but it might not be useful now. And this is happening mm-hmm. all the time. So you're building up this like database of like potentials. And of course, in the me- in the ideal situation, many things come together. Mm-hmm. In the, the moment, right time, in the right place. Yeah, um, but many times they don't. You know, I think eighty percent of the time things aren't working like exactly how I want when I'm making. But I'm aware that oh, that's actually very useful. Um, And just you just make, I make a note of it in my mind. There must be so many mental notes in your there, mind. There are, and obviously I forget lots of things. But I think the ones that are quite powerful immediately stick with me, and then I can return to them. Um, but yeah, and of course there are accidents as well. But it, uh, accidents in the sense you drop your laptop into the box <laughs> or something. No, just like accidents in, in the sense that you might. Uh, randomly drag a, f- a piece of audio into a composition and something magical happens mm. um, versus if you were to intellectually think of it you would never probably do it you know, these kind of things where and, and maybe for example it's completely the wrong pitch and you just pitch it into the key and the clumsiness of that adds some magic yeah. you know th- these kind of I like very simple processes that can exist and that can be exciting in music I don't like to I don't want or like for music to have to do extremely technical things. I feel like there's a lot of magic just with unusual combinations of simple things. Um, and just a sort of like awareness of like where the concentration lies within the music. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, being a classically trained musician, uh, I obviously have encountered this uh, dichotomy or dilemma of mm-hmm. uh, rational uh, versus emotional, yeah. intellectual versus sensual, yeah. although uh, that's an oversimplification in, in itself. Uh, however, uh, this concept of Apollonic versus Dionysus, uh, Dionysic uh, is uh, ever-present from the ancient Greece and I guess uh, even before. Yeah? Yeah. So. Uh, You yourself, uh, during uh, this conversation, already have mentioned both aspects. And uh, at one time, you emphasize uh, the intellectual part, and then this uh, this magical, this unpredictable, maybe uh, b- that which is uh, without uh, your control, outside of bounds of your reach. You know? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm deeply aware of both at all times. Really, I try not to be, obviously, but I think if you practice, if you're in the practice of making all the time. It's just a part of the way that... It almost feels like it changes the way that your brain functions if you do something for so long. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, you just, I just, you just try to find ways of refreshing that awareness. Um, but, yeah, it's just an ongoing sort of deep kind of... Re- That's why I use like research and development because it's more just exploring this in this huge environment and within that, You have all these different experiences, but you have a general understanding of how you are within it. It's quite, a, it's quite unusual. It doesn't have to be like that, but that's the way that I kind of have found myself working. Mm-hmm. 
Would you uh, call yourself a perfectionist as well? No, not at all. I, don't, I think I'm quite good. For I, I, I think I'm quite um, like I allow clumsiness and quite rough aspects to a lot of my compositions mm -hmm. um, because it turns out, and this is something I've rationalized. I don't. I think it would make things worse if I tried to perfect. Mm -hmm the way that I make, because the way that I make already builds in this a kind of roughness. So it's just part of the kind of vocabulary already, and then you can't then... Ref There's a limit to refining the vocabulary, I think, that I, that I establish, if that makes any sense. It does, but uh, at some point you can uh, choose a different language and then your vocabulary expands further. Yeah, but, but what I'm saying is, almost unconsciously, I seem to have a certain vocabulary that c keeps coming up again and again and again. I know what you're talking about. My professor uh, uh, during a master's studies in Estonia, uh, he himself was a rock uh, guitar player. Mm -hmm. And at one point he made a conscious decision to, to discard his guitar playing altogether mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the guitar was uh, like dictating uh, yeah. him what he... He was thinking in terms of uh, the, the guitar. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, I kind of stopped playing the, using the guitar for that reason as well. That's what, one of the reasons why electronic music was helpful to me. Because I became very naive immediately about everything. Mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a useful way, I think, for a composer like to make. Because obviously, yeah, just the, the conditioning of the hand already has a lot of opinions about things. You know, just even like how elegant a shape looks to like a trained musician, mm -hmm. like in, in terms of like a chord shape or, or a series of notes. You see, there's already so many... Certain predisposition. Yeah. Something. So uh, electronic music being so vast, like the, the world of like, you know, you know, it doesn't have to be electronic sounds, but just like processing sounds in a computer, let's say, digital or not. Digital audio. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not like a purist about anything. I just I freely use different terminology, but um, it's just such a vast world that even if you become like a master at something, you still don't. You will never become a master at kind of like the, how vast that world is. So people become seem to become masters at like techno or yeah, maybe like you know, acousmatic like avant-garde electronic music. But you know, the whole world is huge. And then if you just think of like pop music, how much production goes into pop music yeah. in a very technical way. Yeah, sure. It doesn't try to sound like it is. It's extremely technical, especially now. Technical and in, uh, speaking in the words of Rick, uh, Rick Beato, quite boring at times. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, with overproduction and yeah. uh, this polishing of each and every detail, which make the music sound quite uniform. Yeah. That's also probably down to trends as well, and wanting to make things like other successful examples, like many people trying to sound like Taylor Swift's polished production, which is obviously quite, it's, it's quite like sort of glossy and clean and it doesn't really have any, it doesn't really have anything it sounds like more than like the glossy production almost sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I think people get seduced by that and then want to imitate that. Um, I, I think there's a lot of good writing out there, but yeah, it's, production definitely kind of, narrows writing because people get seduced by what you can do with production alone, in, especially in pop music. Considering the fact that probably none of us is a, a person who would call themselves a Swifty, yeah. uh, let's, let's focus, uh, refocus back on, on you. Uh, I am very interested on, uh, in, in the topic of how did you find this gateway into electronic music? What was your first uh, digital audio workstation or maybe a synthesizer? Uh, how, mm -hmm. how did you start I think, it? Out? I think to begin with, I was experimenting with Cubase, actually. Um, a very early version of Cubase because it would have been like a, a, probably the year 2000. Mm -hmm. um, at, at college, um, I was first exposed to sort of like writing with MIDI and also actually using like archive samplers with the floppy disk. Um, but it was, yeah, for a long time, I didn't have any synths, uh, any hardware synths. I did a lot of things like sort of just in Cubase, um, experimenting with very little understanding because this is pre-YouTube and 
it was it felt like there was just no information, and there were very there were very little um, sounds that you could obtain, and you didn't know where to get them. Now it feels like anyone can have access to, for example, every single drum sound ever made like that. Um, if you're like 14 and you're curious, you could you could easily just find out that you can get that. Mm-hmm. But it felt like there was. It was. It felt like it was very hidden knowledge when I started. It might not have been, but it felt like that. Um, and so I just very slowly, you know, experimented, and I definitely didn't make things that I liked for a long time because I was always listening to you know people that were very good, and then listening to what I was doing and thinking, oh, why does this sound like that? Yeah. And it took me a really long time to understand why there was such a radical difference. Uh, and of course, it, there are many reasons why. It's not just like a single, a single reason. Yeah, I, mean, I thought there would be one. <laughs> but, um, and you know, many things, and also my judgment, because uh, everything gets better with time if you care a lot about it. Well, within you invest yourself. Uh, I mean, you invest the time and energy. Yeah, yeah and, like, and, 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 and trying to improve your observation, because I think for a long time my observation skills were very poor. Because I, I felt like I was hearing and understanding the music, but actually I wasn't listening closely enough, and actually there was a lot more going on that I wasn't paying attention to. And at this point, by the way, I'm sort of late teens um, at this point. So yeah, I feel like it took me a long time to sort of get really good at ob- observing and listening carefully to what's going on. Well, you had to recalibrate yourself from uh, the listener's perspective into creator's perspective, musician's perspective. Yeah. You could say, well, for example, uh, currently Latvian National Symphony Orchestra uh, has the joy of working under the baton of uh, Tarmo Bentokovsky, who is a young Finnish uh, con- conductor, mm-hmm. uh, well, with uh, definitely super bright future prospects. I mean, and he says that uh, in, in interview that he, uh, since he, his early teens or even before that mm-hmm. when he was just a child he was studying the scores he was analyzing music so yeah. I think that that's a quite a rare occurrence yeah that's for, incredible. Uh, for a person of such young age yeah. to, to to view something from that perspective yeah from the inner workings yeah and to have the kind of maturity to even to hold, like to hold it in your mind is quite a serious thing, especially if it's like a big piece of work. But yeah, it was just a very slow, very slow process for me. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but after the cue base, uh, what came later? Then, then just a very slow kind of like adding like synthesizers. Like I think the first synthesizer was the Korg Micro Korg, which was obviously very common then. Such a delightful machine. I'm still having great fun. Yeah, with I think it's. Yeah, I do often think back to it. I haven't. I've still got it, but I don't. I haven't used it for a long time. But I did make a lot of things that I really liked with it. Um, much later, even. Mm-hmm. Um, it has a kind of magic, I think, um, and it's easily overlooked because obviously people tend to have an attitude that some synths are more serious than others for for writing or making. But it's definitely great. And then, yeah, just and then over. You know, the last 10 years I've just have so many synthesizers now. Um, I, I still have lots of guitars and upright piano, drums, um, many different types of percussion. Um, do, you know, just lots of hardware synthesizers like you know, Prophet 8 and Power oh. Odyssey and um, the Moog Matriarch, which I think is great. Um, it, loads of guitar pedals, which obviously synths I run through. And just lots of different quite common things now, really, to be honest. Um, at university, I spent a lot of time making in Max MSP. I specialized, I that much, yeah. I specialized in that quite a lot. And I ended up actually even making a visual system, which I toured with for a long time, which I created, uh, which was a completely live 3D structure that could be changed, performed live by somebody. Um, so for like five years, we were performing alongside my music live, uh, this visual system that I created. Um, and just lots of things, yeah. Just, I like making in different mediums, like film and even like animation, like mm-hmm. with, um, animation software like 3ds Max or Blender. Or um, I'm always doing things. Even like actually, I've got into processing the uh, the sim, not simple, but code based visual language, um, which is I think it's a, a variation on Java. Mm-hmm. But it's purely just for visuals. Uh, I don't know if you know processing. Uh, it's been around for a while. 
I mean, I just uh, studied some C sharp, but um, okay. So this is nowhere near the thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is still code. It's just the actual code. Yeah. But it, it is it's just, it's designed by clever people just to be visual a visual based code language that's like Java based. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really nice just for like generating abstract visuals using obviously like logic and you know instructions. But I, I like making it all different forms, and there's definitely a, a crossover between all of these things. Uh, well. When one listens to your music, and thanks to the magic of streaming services, mm-hmm. uh, that's quite accessible, and I should have said it without any irony in my voice, by the way, uh, <laughs> because I, 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 I use uh, those services myself. Um, although you utilize a uh, certain amount of samples, you are, well, at least to my ear, mm-hmm. uh, you are... Uh, um, Focusing much more on the synthesized sound, and, and well, if, if we mentioned already Boards of Canada or, for example, the books, mm-hmm. uh, then uh, I, I think you're quite a different bird from them because your music, uh, in this sense, uh, is uh, synth-based. If you mention Maxim SP uh, and then uh, all, all those timbres which uh, uh, evolve uh, from your conscious thought and maybe from initial the, this initial digital signal, uh, which then you manipulate uh, via your knowledge and uh, all, all, all the, your enticement with uh, architectural and, and, and musical structures. But uh, maybe I have something has escaped my mind, and uh, I, I'm really very far off with uh, this description. No, I, d- I definitely I'm quite synth focused because I'm I'm quite like melodic and harmonic focused mm-hmm. and so drums have often been in the background of the focus of the music um because I, I i like and this might be to do with growing up with popular music and popular music always is very chord and melodic based mm-hmm. um it's always been a part of my this uh, even if i don't want to i always end up writing quite chord or melodic works um in all different styles, but just it just seems to be a big part of it. And of course, with synthesizers, you can design, and that's why I mentioned the word design earlier, you can design a, an, an instrument to some extent, and you can design different functionality. You know, some can be, some can be very delicate and thin, and some can be very, you know, extremely heavy and like take up a lot of space, and you know, some, all these different kind of things. Basically like the orchestra, really. Mm-hmm. You know, you might design a synthesized sound that behaves like a flute section, in an orchestra, or you might design synths that behave like cellos. Uh, I do without. I'm not thinking like this, but it, it is kind of going on unconsciously. And also synths that do not sound anything like uh, the traditional. Yeah, not sound themselves. like, but maybe what I mean is they might have the same functionality. Function, yes, in the yes. composition. Yeah, uh, they might sound very different, but then actually, when you think about it, they're behaving. They're, they're achieving a similar behavior in the music. You know, to add air to something like flutes mm-hmm. might, and or to add like. You know, a busyness like that's that's very thin. That's not that's you know, background, foreground kind of ideas. By the way, do you listen to orchestral music at all? Yeah, I used to listen to a lot. Yeah, um, I haven't for a while, but it's definitely an influence in my writing. Especially just the simple idea of tension and resolve is one of the main things that I think is going on in my music. In that, for example, other other electronic music might. When you're in the moment, you, you might enjoy being in the moment, and there's no sense that it needs to resolve somewhere in the future. I think I always write electronic music that has something that needs to be resolved into the future. So there's often it could be very subtle or quite strong tension. In, in the same way that obviously a lot of classical music throughout history is, is kind of explored, you know, like departure, return. Of course. Um, but that's that's a big part of my music, and I think that's one of the reasons why it sometimes stands out quite a lot amongst, like, techno. Although techno is doing it in the same way as well, but with mainly rhythm, I think. R- you know, rhythmic tension and then rhythmic resolve. But I like... It's more sort of, for me, like, chord, melodic tension and a resolve. Yeah, 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 textural and dynamic... Uh, yeah. In cohesion. But again, like the orchestra, like you know, different textures yeah. and different ways of exploring tension and resolve. Well, yeah. Do you uh, have you formulated a certain system or maybe language, if you will, of uh, musical gestures? If we go back to Baroque era and and, and like 
Joseph Handel or mm -hmm. uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. Uh, they both are like quite typical for their time, but uh, from our viewpoint, uh, very peculiar creators of, mus uh, of musical meaning, uh, if one understands how to interpret that. So, in your music, would you say that you are uh, utilizing certain gestures or systems of gestures? Even? Yeah, um, I think I'm just, I tend to still love like, obvious things such as, you know, the degrees of intervals and how some are obviously some feel more um, resolved and, and there is a stretching that exists between notes mm -hmm. and just always being conscious of, you know, maintaining tension or, and then knowing when to, to release it uh, and just, like suspensions. Like, I mean, to be honest, my music probably, Bach seems to like do that so frequently. I think I did much like on a more glacial um, uh, scale, like Mahler or something, like where it takes a long time for something to resolve. Instead of like, it feels like Bach's doing it all the time in very intricate ways. Although that could be the fractal theory as well. Like to, yeah. Like the micro level yet on macro level. Yeah, it's still yeah the both. Mm. But I think I like maybe, yeah, more sort of 20th century even sort of um, classical music. But I mean, yeah, definitely like Mahler and I like dr dramatic and like emotional kind of and swelling as well, like the kind of like swelling that happens in like the era of Mahler, which is you know the kind of romantic like dynamic sort of like almost sounds a little bit drunk. I like this kind of sensation, you know, that happens in like the Fifth Symphony. Um, I, I I feel like I do things like that with. Um, with like the dynamics of synthesizers. So I might like have a huge chord mm -hmm. and then just with like the articulation of volume, uh, allow it to kind of do this, which I, th I think is a thing that a lot of people overlook, just simply like having different ingredients fluctuate dramatically with volume, which is, you know, it's like fundamental, but it's very easy to not do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah but it's so, it's so amazing. I do that a lot live. It's really a, a big part of what I do live is constantly constantly adjusting volumes of layers and making it really sort of like swell and breathe and sometimes being very crude and then sometimes yeah. being very delicate and then, very sudden. then you uh, can see why it does not work uh, with the recorded music on streaming services because uh, of the compression maybe this uh, standardized uh, uh, compression rate uh, mm -hmm. where anything which is below certain threshold or above certain mm -hmm. threshold gets uh, cut and uh, put within this box or yeah. this scope, which is a bit boring again. Yeah, it narrows yeah, the possibility, but I mean, yeah, it's just a lot of people, well, I'm looking at a lot of people still come to see my shows and I think are excited by that kind of a performance, um, especially because it just, like I say, there tends to be more of a, an abstract um, avant-garde electronic music or, or a very club-based electronic music. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of creative space between these two worlds. Of course. Um, but you don't witness it very often, actually, it feels like. Um, and there's lots of people doing it online, but I mean, you don't witness it very often in the venue. Mm -hmm. in, um, it feels like people are forced towards the functionality of these two worlds. That's just my opinion. I'm not saying that's a... Fact. No, I agree with you completely. And again, uh, that uh, is hugely dependent on... Uh, uh, what function the music serves in the minds and hearts of the listeners? Is it yeah. just a utility or uh, is it something which is necessary for enriching your soul? And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and therefore, yeah, that's, you, you can see very, very, uh, very the attitudes towards music process. In my mind and in my experience, although I have dabbled in the electronic music uh, only my fingertips and uh, by no means uh, can I view myself as a professional in this regard, I still uh, feel that uh, there is a certain sense of isolation and a certain sense of, uh, if not loneliness, uh, then being alone. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, I'm quite curious, uh, what role does a listener play in your uh, musician's life in, and in your perception? Because it, it's easy to just get lost, uh, if you mention microcore, you just here put one techno uh, uh, preset on and, and, and you have a party for yourself for hours. However, uh, at a certain point you, you, you become, 
or you you might feel uh, that something is lacking and uh, there there is uh, this thing called uh, the exchange of energy and uh, and uh, getting uh, this feedback this hugely important thing, not 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 within youtube comments or emails uh, but 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 the energy of the listener how, yeah. how how big of a role does it play for you yeah quite a big one i think i've always wanted to share ideas that i feel are worth sharing and I want it to be like a conversation to some extent. I don't like the idea of making something a nut and keeping it just for myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, yeah, and I'm a big fan of just art being shared and seen by anyone, and, and but all makers sharing their art really. I, I almost view people not sharing their art in a slightly negative way. Like regardless of how good it is or how good they think it is, mm -hmm. I feel like it's it's a, a natural part of making is to share it, or you know, just to, just to allow it to be witnessed. I'm not talking about how people value it, but no, no, it's, no. it's a quite natural part of it for me. And obviously, when I perform live, I do. It's a very you know concrete version of that because I witness. We all witness in the room the same thing. Um, and that actually inspires the making a lot as well. I feel like a lot of my understanding of choices, make choice making is informed by performing live and witnessing how things change, the functionality changes. But Lots of things change live. Like the most simple thing can sound very profound live to me and mm -hmm. the opposite is true. Things that I thought were very interesting become, can become very flat and lifeless in a venue. Mm -hmm. So I'm always interested in how I'm le learning things about my own understanding. And obviously everything's shifting as well. Nothing is set in stone. I, my understanding and my taste is shifting all the time. But it's trying to... I feel like if you put music into a space with other people, you increase the chances of understanding it better. But it's obviously very turbulent and painful. <laughs> it is indeed. As you probably know. I mean... Uh, there is a certain aspect of vulnerability yeah. uh, in, in, in laying your, putting yourself in front of yeah, all those yeah, listeners. Yeah. Do, you, uh, do you shy away from being vulnerable or do you uh, embrace it or encourage it? Yeah, I, your own vulnerability. I've, I've gotten more confident as I've gotten older um, in the last sort of five years, but definitely the first ten years of performing, I used to find it very difficult. But mainly because I feel like and this goes back to a question earlier about making music on your own and maybe a loneliness that exists within that process. It felt like performing live was a misrepresentation of what it actually was. And it felt like everything was not sincere. Mm -hmm. It took me a long time to make being in a live space performing to feel like a sincere representation of what I am as a maker. And so confidence came from that. But I think, I mean, I think electronic music's is I have lots of opinions about this. For example, in my opinion, electronic music, early electronic music, was born out of the desire to kind of go a bit beyond a pair of hands and just to see what was possible in a new kind of like language. And then there's this tension because people then wanted like, okay, but bring it back to the hands again because performance has mainly been seen through humans using like they you know their body. So it feels like. It was born out of this like deep desire to go elsewhere, but then it's like, no, but now bring it back in a way that can be digested. And there's this tension. And so, you know, there's many different ways to, to approach that. For example, Ortec are just performing pitch black in like just darkness. And so then you, you're focusing on like what, the, what their minds have achieved with like the sonic palette. And that feels more. That feels more like a, what the early, like Stockhausen, you know, Stockhausen and people even before, like Edgar Vares. It feels more to do with what they would. I, I'm just guessing. I obviously don't know, but ah, they feels, cannot it, say that it's not true. So it, it, it feels, could have been it feels more in line with like where electronic music was, where it wanted to go to some extent. Mm -hmm. And so I have this tension in me about, you know, a lot of the time when I'm making, I feel like I'm making in a composer in a almost like a composer like in classical music and it turns out that I'm using these ingredients. So performing live can feel very problematic because 
it's just, it's just it can just feel like you're doing things that aren't actually part of the integrity of what you do. But these actually recently, I've had, I feel like I'm starting to be almost perform like a conductor. When I mentioned, for example, just constantly changing level mm-hmm. as a conductor, obviously would like emphasizing things, de-emphasizing things yeah. constantly, and that's just one aspect. But that's huge. Um, that's an integral aspect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, so. Just naturally, I've just, yeah, I, I, I improvise a lot as a player, but a lot of what I'm doing almost feels like a conductor with groups of, infam- you know, groups of like sound, like, and just, uh, you know, play, being playful with, you know, the set of ingredients that I've got. Mm. So it's kind of getting older, you know, having better judgment and feeling more confident, but also paying attention to the fact that how do I want to represent my music in in a way that feels more relevant to to my music because you can anyone can do anything but i like things to actually um feel um like they are like sincere like um, if that makes sense but, which is very a problematic word in a way for electronic music in, in my mind just because i feel like even to this day 2024 people witnessing somebody perform electronic music with a laptop or with, it doesn't matter what it is, versus seeing somebody with a guitar. Yeah. Even though the synthesizer predates the electronic guitar, I feel like there's a natural prejudice in people's minds of all types. Yes. The, it, I don't know, just, the latter is, is just not a, a real musician. As yeah, uh, or, or, and indeed a performance. I think that it, the word performance isn't like... Uh, mm-hmm like attributed sometimes. And I, I don't have a hard opinion about this. I'm just aware that there are these tensions because mm. I experience them. And it's just interesting because, it, this, this, I mean, the funny thing is electronic music is so dominant now, but still it feels like there is a, still a tension with um, pure electronic music. So for example, and that's already a dangerous word, but what I mean is like, so no one's singing, Um, and maybe it's all the sounds are made, for example, within a computer, um, which is kind of everywhere. But still, if you were to if you were to have somebody perform, I don't know, along maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong about this. I'm just trying to think. Maybe th- times have changed, but because obviously dance music is often a, you know kind of what I'm describing. But I think I think I'm again talking about music that isn't doesn't have the functionality of dance music, but is electronic. I think people still have some kind of like uh, distance from that, like an uh, internal distance. Well, uh, you have mentioned multiple genres as well as I have, uh, like uh, techno, drum and bass, uh, uh, ambient, and uh, etc. Uh, but uh, where where there is this distinction of uh, this umbrella term electronic dance music, I would much prefer another term, intellectual dance music, IDM, not EDM. And uh, although one might argue that uh, it's definitely possible to dance to your music, but uh, uh, this uh, your music does not seem like that of the sort of being in the background, being just uh, an addition to a certain interior or a situation. Uh, it uh, definitely merits uh, uh, deep listening and uh, involvement with the processuality of your music. Because, again, uh, with your attention to detail and with your uh, uh, architectonic uh, think, uh, way of thinking, uh, it's, it's definitely valuable for the listener to go along for the ride. And probably that's one of the reasons why, for example, I appreciate uh, what you are doing and m- many uh, others. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think I don't think I make dance music. I think there are some ingredients that are in common, but for the most part, I I think my music is kind of song based. Like mm-hmm. the structures are quite sort of like a songwriter's perspective, and, and and as I there are some kind of classical kind of qualities going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, like symphonic, like orchestral. Yes, 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 yes. But it, it's very much just. I like. It's all about the writing for me to some extent, um, and obviously the design of sounds as well. But definitely, like, I, I, do, I do want the music to be. I, I feel like it. It should have a certain intensity to draw the listener in, um, and it, this is this this is good and bad because there have been times when I've played alongside 
techno artist and I've refreshed the whole night yeah. um, because of because I choose to make differently. Um, and then obviously there are times when people just want the, the functionality yeah, and yeah. I might actually be too um, problematic, too disruptive. Yes. It, 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 within my music, I like to have disruption. Exactly, exactly. That's what uh, I, I wanted to mention because uh, uh, in my circles, in the academic uh, musician circles, especially when I was, I was younger and, and a student, uh, certain people frowned upon electronic music as being too square, uh, too predictable, too utilitarian. Mm -hmm. And uh, your music, uh, although before the conversation we mentioned music of Soundgazer and they go to extremes like uh, adding and, uh, and subtracting and, 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 and making people maybe even uncomfortable mm -hmm. with uh, all those uh, uh, unequal and unsquare things but still yeah. within this sort of a square structure of the overall architecture with the um, uh, the use of accents, uh, of textures, uh, of emphasizing uh, that which is probably not uh, viewed upon generally as like the strong part of uh, the, the the strong beat. Yeah, uh, you refresh things uh, to the degree where uh, some would view it as oh my god, really? Yeah, that's not dance music. It's not danceable. But yeah. but, but but it's very. Uh, intellectually stimulating and also emotionally uh, like uh, sincere yeah just like you mentioned before yeah this, I mean thank you yeah there's a lot there's a lot of distilling going on there's a lot of reducing there's that things down to a very sort of like precise point to some extent um, but at the same time there's lots of things that are left within the composition that are quite w more wild than others there's just there's just it's the same I think in any art form there's just lots of Contrast and different ingredients that have different functionality, and you know, there's some things that are emphasized and some things that are not, and just I don't know. It's like a moving image, like a moving painting. Is mm -hmm. it's kind of just lots of things, but they're all like the, like well known qualities of music. I think, but I pay attention to them a lot when I'm making. Um, obviously, then you end up with like a very you know, specific version of everything, like, even if it's just a single note, it might be... It might just be, a single note. You know, like, in the background, that maybe just, yeah. it might be adding a little bit of tension, but it might be very specific, like, the tone of it, and maybe mm -hmm. how heavy it is, how, how set back how it is. Regular, or, you know, your whole thing. Your whole yeah, thing. just all these different aspects. Um, and maybe that's contrasted with something extremely dry and close, and so already just those two ingredients, so even if the, the listener doesn't want to, the brain is probably acknowledging that there's, you know, there's distance, you know, all these kind of like... Exactly. Now, now the music becomes uh, three-dimensional, yeah, well, let's say not dimensional, yeah. you can not just view it from A to Z, like linearly, yeah. and not uh, vertically, yeah? Yeah. no, the, the background and foreground, it makes sense when you mentioned uh, the visual aspect of your creativity, because yeah. uh, that, uh, the cinematograph uh, cinemat cinematographic aspect of that requires yeah. uh, understanding the interaction of uh, background, foreground, middle ground, mm -hmm. all those aspects. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of similarity. Yeah, I'm just thinking about opacity, if I'm like, I think of sound sometimes in terms of opacity. Like, is it like a faint, ghostly version on top of something else? Or is it extremely, like, opaque and mm -hmm. and, and, and you you can, you know, I like, I like the idea of, like, visibility of ingredients. Yeah. And also that's achieved, obviously, through volume as well, like, just dynamics, just things coming and going out of composition. Um... They, not only do you perceive that, but that changes your perception of the other things. You know, just all these. I, like, I just like the kind of things that can be achieved through, like almost like the most traditional techniques of composing. And uh, as soon as we talk about the setup, which involves more than one speaker, it, uh, the panoramic aspect and uh, just uh, uh, designing your sound uh, through uh, the use of uh, this. Uh, speaker architecture becomes quite more and more relevant, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Although I, I do, in a way, feel like I write music in a way that should just work in a room on an instrument, like, to some extent. I, I want it to have... I want it to be able to be reduced down and the idea makes sense and, it, and, it, and the parts mm -hmm. are written well. 
By the way, uh, you mentioned uh, this aspect of sound engineering in your education mm -hmm. and uh, in your musician's per personality. Uh, there is this, uh, how to say, pra urban legend or a joke among sound engineers and uh, people mm -hmm. who master uh, various tracks of music that as much as you would like to focus on super clear sound of uh, studio monitor setup and uh, hearing all the frequencies mm -hmm. and, uh, and, 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 and tuning and fine-tuning things, in the end of the day you still take a couple of uh, computer speakers, those small ones or maybe uh, this music center, the, those from the, the, with lights and all, all, yeah. all this jazz, uh, just to test out yeah. how your music will sound in the most basic uh, yeah. setup. So, uh, in, in your opinion, and uh, when it comes to your music, uh, do you consider this factor as well, that, yeah. that many people want to uh, hear yeah. all of your music, how is it intended and what is there at all? Yeah, yeah I try to listen on every type of speaker possible, as much as possible, mm -hmm. all the time. Frequently, every, almost every day. Wow. I mean, just within my house, I have maybe like five, six different types of speakers. I'm constantly going between them, but also listening in different locations. So with, with headphones, traveling, listening, listening at home at night, in the morning, I find that everything changes from morning to night. Things that sound really slow can sound extremely fast all of a sudden at different times of the day. Of course, yeah. You know, these kind of psychological effects. So... Yeah, but definitely it's important to listen to music in different, on different speakers and in different rooms because obviously the room also has an impact on the sound. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you just try to create an average um, in your mind as to what is going on. But it's, sound is like a, a kind of a problematic thing in that way that it is forever changing. So it's, I think that, you know, there, there's good judgment, but there's also really there's just trying to find the better average of things. Um, I'm sure that the same is true for like orchestral level that you know maybe there are rooms in the world for even like the, you know the best orchestral rooms in the world maybe there's only five that are really loved and like some are even at a high level some are more problematic because of the way that the orchestra sounds in the space of know? course you have the shape of the concert hall yeah uh, and when it's really full like the yes, effect yes, of that has yes, yes. what is uh the interior material yeah. is it tapestry or is it wood or whatever yeah. and maybe even the time of year like you know yeah, know, maybe, yeah. Maybe. how damp or dry the room yeah. is yeah the humidity <laughs> level definitely yeah, also plays yeah. yeah sure uh, again uh, because I, I'm curious, mm -hmm. do tell uh, what uh, type of studio monitors and sound systems do you have? And if you mention headphones, uh, do yeah. you use uh, active noise cancelling or do you are you not a fan of that? Um, I have those as well, but I've been using the Olo O L L O ones. I don't yes. know if you know those. Um, they're, they're very um, revealing and kind of transparent. That's a word that's used all the time, obviously. Um, I've been using focal speakers for a long time. Um, and many different speakers really the, the head speakers as well H-E-D-D -D, German yes, yes, yes. Um, but as I say I'm not I, don't, I, I go through many through different oh PMC as well I have PMC hi-fi speakers so just different types of speakers as well for different kind of uh, you know for different consumers that's good as well because they they all sound different anyway but on top of that they're different because they're designed for different people mm -hmm. but yeah, different headphones, including <clears throat> the most basic Apple, you know, cord headphones. Mm -hmm. um, the new Apple, yeah, noise cancelling ones. Just many, many, many different types. Also, obviously, just on computers, just listening out of the computer itself, the speakers that are built into the computer, like on an iMac, for example, or a, or a laptop. <clears throat> Although your mileage might vary greatly, MacBook speakers are one of the top of the class and some of the Windows laptop speakers yeah. suck. Yeah, the new MacBook Pro speakers sound incredible, really. Um, How? What's the engineering behind it? I, I literally can't yeah, comprehend. Yeah, it is, it, is, it is amazing. Um, but yeah, so, I don't know, yeah, definitely. Um, Would you consider yourself an audiophile? Mm, not really. Not the one who listens to this one. Not really, no, because I'm happy to listen. I mean, I don't know. Sometimes I do get angry in the way that an audiophile would if something's <laughs> being played. Very <laughs> shitty. Yeah, like out of a poor system, because I would know what it could... In my head, I would hear a better version. So yes, yes. I have these moments, but 
I'm not like, you know, I, I mean, we live in a time actually where a lot of people do actually have quite good quality, affordable, commercial, cheap speakers. They're actually quite good sounding. Yeah. Yeah. You know, obviously 10, 15 years ago, the standard was much lower for small, commercial, affordable speakers. So um, we're, the world is getting better in certain yeah, respects. In, yeah, in some respects, I think so, yeah. I mean, of course, that doesn't mean that people know what they're... I don't know. I think people are obsessed with, like, bass and loudness, whereas obviously there's a lot more to it than that. <laughs> Although we know the bass and loudness is just the way to mask uh, te technological or technical deficiencies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I'm, I kind of go between the two worlds. But I, I come into contact with people that are, you know, some more lean towards being a perfectionist. I know Neil's is definitely more towards the perfectionist um, side of okay, definitely. all aspects of sound production. I'm, I'm very different, I think. I think I'm happy to be more embrace, I embrace a lot of sort of different technologies um, of all different sort of eras and different kind of qualities. Um, so, but yeah, it's, I don't know, it's just... It's, I, I just like making, I don't know, I just think I'm too interested in making and I don't have a limitation on uh, uh, in that way, like a precise way like that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it makes a difference though when I perform, actually. I find that I really need to have good monitoring to to really perform well and to actually get have a sensitive understanding of... But do you use ear monitors or... I don't, I, sh monitors. I probably should, but... I'm, the, re the main reason why I don't is because I like to experience the physicality that's similar to what the audience witnesses, so that we're actually in a similar, so that we have a similar experience. Because mm -hmm. I feel like, whilst this is more accurate, uh, it sort of removes you from the situation. Yeah, a little bit. Degree. It makes, yeah, it, ma it feels like it's two different experiences, and it's already two different experiences, of course. Yes. But I like the fact that there's some power and weight thrown out of speakers near me that mirror. The, the physicality that's going out of the front, and I care about the, this being similar somehow. Do you use earplugs though? No, no, no. No. I don't have it crazy loud, but. Yeah, yeah for the musician, it's a different situation. Yeah. But um, I just like some, phys some physicality. But I need to have very high quality monitors. And luckily in Europe, there are a lot of amazing monitors, but I've had some terrible shows in America where there was, it was like old 90s monitors that were just like, just so. They, they did. They just had such a strange art, like um, what would you call it, like a contour to the sound mm -hmm. that just made all my, made me second guess all my judgments live. You know, like the sensitivity that was supposed to sound differently, <laughs> and yeah, everything. Yeah, and apparently it does not sound. Just, yeah, everything, even like the volume of things. Like that, that should that is not what is going on. Mm -hmm. And then of course, then you don't know what's going out at the front. But so my, I am quite more towards audio file when it comes to performing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but especially like my um listening on stage so that i can actually do a better job as well so that, so that i can be more precise if i want to be precise do you i think you well, I, I want to i want to be able to if i want to like in a moment mm -hmm. and know that what it will do roughly before i do it um you know for example if you just bring in like a bit of improvisation very loud but know how far to go and know what that will sound like and what that will feel like mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it, with terrible monitoring you either have no understanding I, I don't think you have any understanding because you'll get a version but it's like who knows to me and to the audience but with good monitoring you will understand or even before you get there uh, you know it's just, it's just very like intricate things but yeah it's important I think Obviously, it's that everyone knows as well that good monitoring gets a better performance out of everyone. That's obviously the same as a good room as well. Like the, for like a, a chamber or a mm -hmm. quartet, a room that gives enough feedback, you know, enough re reverb, so that they can hear themselves just enough, mm -hmm. so that it reinforces the playing. Versus if it was like hundred percent dry, it would it's too dead. And if it's too much, it's nightmarish for the musicians. And uh, it needs to be in between a sweet spot of like a little bit of reflection, the right kind of reflection. Yes. But it's the same, I need the right kind of like reflection really to make accurate choices. And then obviously if I want to be chaotic and messy, mm. that's fine, but I want to also contrast that with being very accurate. Yeah, you need to have some baseline where you can yeah. rely on the things going the way you are intending them to go. Yeah. Uh, and, and just that you understand them because you can misunderstand. Accurate representation of what to Yeah. So it's just but that's that's probably as far as I go with that.
For those uh, who, just like me, have listened only to your audio performances, uh, what would uh, your uh, concert situation look like? What's your rig? Uh, because uh, if we mention Nils once more, uh, for him, uh, him it's like the whole stage completely packed with uh, various yeah. different instruments. How is it for you? So, yeah, it's a very minimal setup. And just recently, we've been heavily exploring the audio-visual world, uh, where we have a complete performance in the visual world alongside my performance. You know, for example, there's no, there's not just playback of visual content. It's an actual performance that's constantly evolving. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that makes it very interesting because it's, it's almost like live cinema, but abstract live cinema. Is there a VJ with you or? Yeah. So, um, I'm, tra I'm traveling with someone who's performing, but it's not VJing. It's like we've created our own custom instrument, a visual kind of like instrument mm -hmm. in touch designer that allows for the visuals to constantly evolve according to the to the uh, the user um, so it's that, that's very magical because obviously like videos that are, like look really amazing but are just playing it's very dead well, what we're doing is very like, constantly evolving and alive and of course we perform differently all the time so it's basically a very sort of cinematic experience that explores um, a very kind of abstract landscape, really. Um, and my music covers this a very big spectrum from, you know, very delicate and intimate and soft to very physical and heavy and, de you know, just m many, many things. Many things, always like, a, you know, a symphony tries yeah. to achieve many yeah. things. I, I'm currently laughing, like smirking, because I thought about Wagner and Gesamtkunstwerk. Right. This uh, artwork which encompasses all the mediums, all the uh, aspects, and for you it's like audio-visual, maybe even the sensory uh, with, uh, with the I mean, smell, etc. Definitely, I like to present like a very um, strong kind of performance that is lasting in people's minds. Um, but on the abstract side of things, we, there's, it's, it's hard to explain really, but it's, it's definitely very, um, there's lots of very physical and bold uh, moments that like are just very vivid. The color is used a lot, just like color is used a lot in the music, but also then just moments of very like black and white and also very stark music and just, there's lots of, you know, huge contrast and, a journey that goes through various themes, really. It's kind of, yes, yeah, I guess closer to symphonic form, the whole show. Mm -hmm. And there's self-referencing in, in, the, in the show, just like you would get in symphony form. So basically, uh, if uh, we would ask the question, what can we expect from rival consoles uh, mm -hmm. in the, the coming years? Uh, we could expect more and more immersive experience and uh, maybe even uh, life-changing changing experience for one who attends your live show instead of just listening to you on streaming platforms. I, I mean, definitely people have a, a very dramatic experiences when they see me live because I'm lucky that they come and tell me you know, such things. But yeah, it's, I think... Uh, my music's quite charged with emotion, so I think that always is very important to witness in a, in a live space because people completely underestimate how physical and powerful it is in a, in a space to witness that. Um, and so that's why I think they're quite shocked when they do because it's it, uh, listening at home really is quite a, a reduced listening experience, um, I think. So there's something about the chaos and like, also even the fact that you're listening to it at night, which it often is, you know, all these small things actually play a big part in everything. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that you're listening alongside other people that are probably like-minded. There's a lot, there's a lot of drama in, in the music that I think people, um, it's quite sort of like liberating for them. Like real drama, well, I say real drama, it's just an opinion, but I like, I like to create what I think is quite a lot of drama throughout the set. And especially in certain moments, and, and then like huge sort of like euphoric moments. Um, tension and release. Yeah. Tension but, yeah. and release. In, in a, a myriad of ways. It's, <laughs> that is, is what I'm trying to do, really. I mean, because I want that from music a lot of the time. I, I like to be pulled in directions and then, you know, to be released into something else. So I've, I'm, I've always been trying to do it 
with my music. And of course, the live show is like the most heightened version of that. Um, Sir, uh, I definitely uh, wish you many more uh, cathartic moments, both in your music and maybe in experiencing some other person's music. But luckily, during this conversation, we focus for the most part only on, on, on your music, which definitely merits uh, uh, like a closer inspection, investigation, actually, immersion. So it was a huge pleasure to talk with you, and uh, I wish you a good show tomorrow in Riga. Mm -hmm which will definitely make sense for people who are uh, watching this conversation a year from now. But uh, I, again, I, I hope that uh, people experience your music and maybe get some life-changing moments in the process. Yeah, thank you very so, much. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me.